And good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> we're in a, a, a world that's uh, full of uncertainty right now. And uh, this certain amount of uncertainty is not unusual, but the extra uncertainty is uh, uh, really difficult to handle these days. And you're probably following the news as much as I am on that regard. So um, we've had the COVID-19 uncertainty and its uh, disruptions affect our markets, uh, related economic factors to that. Politics, which is, uh, I guess, a very mild term to express what's going on over in Ukraine right now. Uh, trade barriers and trade agreements uh, come and go and get uh, worked on and so on, and that impacts the market. A longer term a consideration is world population and consumption trends. The ethanol biofuel mandates were a big item back in 2006 to about 2010 or 12, and they are uh, becoming an important factor again, and I'll comment on that. The currencies are a day-to-day -day item that can affect markets. And of course, last but not least is weather and its impact on production on and uh, just the uh, weather forecasts and its impact on prices. So uh, from an economic point of view, uh, this is a chart of the S&P 500 index, the major stock index in the US comprised of 500 of the major stocks. And you can, you can see the uptrend that we had since this recession low of 2009. And uh, that was uh, in part financed by government coffers uh, with economic stimulus, as in uh, providing bonds and buying bonds, putting money into the economy and so on. Later on, in, uh, you can see that COVID drop in March of 2020, that should be. And uh, then the economic stimulus that came out of that, and it continues, but it is being uh, pulled back a bit in the last few months and then interest rates uh, because of inflation that is partly at least, if not entirely inspired by the billions of economic stimulus, um, interest rates are scheduled to rise. And indeed the Bank of Canada raised the bank rate this morning by one quarter of a percent as expected. The, the Canadian uh, graph for the TSX looks about the same as that last one. Similar kinds of factors, uh, economic stimulus, inflation, those kinds of things. Uh, this is just a picture that you've probably seen of the uh, COVID virus uh, impact around the world. 427 million cases reported, a lot that were not reported and are not reported now particularly. Uh, about 6 million reported deaths, about a million deaths in the U.S. and about 36,000 deaths in Canada, plus a lot of other damage and uh, cost in the meantime. And so that's had quite an impact on the economies. What I'm showing here is a chart from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. And what I'm going to zoom in on here, this is a graph of the expected growth in meat production and consumption uh, from 2021 to 2030. What I have squared off here in the red is the low income and middle income uh, low to middle income countries and the expected growth in their meat consumption of the various kinds of meats, which include poultry in the blue line, beef and veal in the gray, uh, pork in the green, and then sheep in the amber. So the, the message here though is that the low to, uh, and low to middle income countries are expected to have the largest growth in meat consumption over the next nine or 10 years or further out than that. And that implies more demand for feed grains to feed those animals, feed grains and protein for that matter. So that implies strong demand and increasing demand for grains. Turning to a specific graph on China, this is a China food import by year graph going back to the year 2000 and ending the year 2020. And you can see the rapid acceleration of China food imports. And uh, I think we're all aware that China is a major, and for Canada, one of the major importers of our grains. Biofuel content uh, in, ga in gasoline and diesel has risen over the years. You can see back in 2006, 
the sharp ramp up from there. And this is a worldwide graph or an estimated worldwide graph. But anyway, uh, in the US, that was the biofuel mandate, renewable fuel standard that came in in 2006. And it caused uh, a large increase in ethanol uh, production and usage of corn for ethanol. So about uh, roughly a third of the US corn that's produced gets used in the manufacturing of ethanol each year. It's about 5.2 billion bushels each year of which about a third comes back to the market in the form of uh, distiller's grains. You can see the, uh, the increase continued from a worldwide perspective and then dropped in that 2020 year. That drop is a result of the lower amount of fuel consumption due to COVID activities or COVID uh, restricted activities is more like it. So uh, it's since rebounded. And this next graph shows the ethanol price going back to 2005. And it's quite a volatile price graph actually. And so that implies a lot of um, profits and sometimes losses for the ethanol industry in the US. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the newer and maybe lower financed companies went broke when corn prices rose uh, after the ethanol plants got built. And so it's been a bit of a rocky road, but anyway, from what I read right now, that level sliding over to the right-hand side of this graph, that level of about $1.50 a gallon and higher is a profitable level and a level that encourages uh, production of ethanol and therefore usage of corn. So that had an impact uh, in the last few months on corn prices just because of the increasing ethanol production that being demanded by the uh, rebound in the economy as uh, COVID hopefully wanes. Turning to the currencies, the Canadian dollar has been rather flat for the net last number of years, although uh, you can see that sharp drop back in 2016 and again the, the drop in uh, February of 2020 when COVID cut loose, February, March 2020, since rebounded but is uh, trading very much sideways in the last few months between about 77 and 80 cents. And, and more specifically right now between about 77 and 78 and 79 cents and seems to be really stuck in there. Uh, the dollar moved briefly higher this morning with the announcement from the Bank of Canada of the one quarter rise in interest rates, but only briefly higher. So it's still stuck just below 79 cents. And from a chart perspective, which the currencies tend to respect uh, to quite an extent from my following of them, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the chart that we're stuck within right now. And so it'll take a move higher than about 83 and a half to really break out. Um, you would think that with crude oil prices rising with the activities going on in Ukraine and the rapid run up in crude oil prices that the Canadian dollar would rise, but it hasn't been and I'll, I'll come to that in a minute or so here. What I'm showing here is the price of West Texas intermediate crude oil in US dollars per barrel compared to in black line again, the Canadian dollar value. And uh, the correlation between the oil market and the Canadian dollar is typically about 80%. So fairly well correlated in price compared to that crude oil price. And sometimes you've heard the term that it's an energy currency that we have here in Canada. You can see though, in the last uh, few weeks, that correlation has not been good. In fact, the crude oil price has been rising rapidly and is even higher this morning, but the Canadian dollar is still stuck. And uh, you might wonder why that is, but part of it is because of uh, what's happening with the US dollar. And this next graph shows in red, the US dollar index. So the red line is UN dollar index. And again, the black line is the Canadian dollar. The US dollar index is made up of a basket of currencies comprised of mainly the Euro uh, and partly the yen, the pound, British pound, Canadian dollar, Swedish krona, and Swiss franc. And uh, you can see here by looking at these two graphs on the one page that there's for the most part, an inverse relationship between that US dollar index and the Canadian dollar. So you can see on the right hand side, the US dollar index has risen rapidly lately. And uh, that rise in the US dollar index is suppressing or holding back the Canadian dollar just because of the relationship between these currencies. So that's one reason, at least, that uh, the Canadian dollar is being withheld right now. 
Of course, uh, a lower Canadian dollar tends to be positive for our commodity prices that we sell and uh, tends to be somewhat negative for things like machinery parts and imports of machinery like John Deere's and so on. Okay. Uh, turning to the weather, this is a map of the United States, obviously, and showing here, uh, this is as of the end of last May, showing in the circled area is the drought areas as of last May. Those drought areas only intensified as the summer progressed. And of course, as we know, that uh, dry area in the northern U.S. also extended well up into the Canadian prairies. This is a graph or a, a chart of the... Uh, map of the precipitation for two week period in May. And the reason I'm showing this is just a reminder of that we had fairly good germination in pretty much all the areas, but the North Peace last spring. So we had fairly good germination for seed, but you all know what happened after that. And one reason I'm showing that is that there was a lot of comparison of last year's situation to 2002. In 2002, I remember we didn't have we didn't have at least at Vermilion enough germination moisture to have crops germinate. In fact, lots of land didn't even get seeded, it was so dry. So uh, at least in my opinion, the 2002 was way worse in many respects than this last year. Okay, and this is what happened of course after that. This shows the uh, percentage of average rainfall in the period of June 11th through September 8th, which we could call the growing season last year. Uh, the portions in red on the on the east side of the province, for the most part, are less than 25% of average precipitation. The amber portion, 20 to 25 to 50% of average precipitation, and then the odd green area where precipitation was uh, near average or, or abundant. And so the area, those areas generally had pretty good crops, but uh, hit and miss elsewhere, depending on showers and so on. And you know uh, probably very well about the situations where someone got a thunder shower or a bit of a shower and someone half a mile down the road got nothing and there was quite a difference in crop yield as a result of that. Same up in Vermillion. Turning to some commodity specific topics. Um, on the wheat, first of all, the world wheat ending stocks have been drawn down lately. Um, partly because of increase in uh, consumption, but also uh, uh, lower production in some of the major exporting countries, particularly the United States. I'm showing here also an estimate of China's share for the last few years of uh, world wheat stocks. The reason I'm showing that is that China doesn't export wheat. And so anything above those X's for those years uh, is the rest of the world, you could say. And that tends to magnify the uh, effect of the drawdown by major exporters of that world wheat ending stock situation. So it's getting a little tighter than it shows, but nonetheless, it's not that tight. In, in terms of the US situation, for several consecutive years, production has uh, been less than usage. And because of that, there's been quite a drawdown in US wheat ending stocks. The lower production wasn't so much because of dryness and crop production issues down there. It was more a matter of reduced acreage because wheat had not been economically competitive with other crops. Uh, showing here Russian wheat production, and you can see how it has ramped up over the years and is generally uh, in that 80 million ton area. And so Russia is a major producer and they have become the major exporter of wheat. In fact, they are the number one exporter of wheat in the world right now. Well, maybe with the exception of right at the moment, and you know why. You can see over there on the, the left side, Ukraine is 9% uh, of world wheat exports. So they're also a large exporter of wheat. So my understanding right now from reading is that uh, that Black Sea area is pretty much shut down even from Russian ports. And part of the reasons for that is that uh, it's just too dangerous to be in there. So any ships that are not owned by, by Russia are somewhat concerned about even being in there in that, that area of the world right now. So things are kind of shut down and that's really what's driving this wheat market higher is the prospects that the uh, wheat that comes out of Ukraine and Russia, which is about 29% of world wheat exports combined uh, is going to be 
interrupted for an extended period of time, meaning that that people, countries that need wheat will be moving to uh, other countries such as uh, United States, Canada, Argentina, Australia for their wheat needs. And that's what's driving the price higher. And also, of course, the uncertainty plus speculation is involved too. What I'm showing here is the Minneapolis spring wheat futures in black for this last year compared to the Kansas City wheat futures in magenta. Uh, the Minneapolis, just as a reminder, relates to our hard red spring wheat prices and the Kansas City wheat market on the futures relates to our CPS prices. So back here in the spring, we had the dryness in the Northern Plains and the Canadian prairies start to drive that Minneapolis spring wheat futures higher and it, it did so right into the end of the year. And then there was a drop off uh, as speculators had particularly exited the market and maybe some buyers had their needs at least for the short term fulfilled. And then lately though, that Kansas City wheat market, it took off in the fall, mainly be based on the uh, dryness in the US winter wheat area. And that is still a concern. And that uh, crop, which is now coming out of dormancy and is, in, is growing in the Southern regions is in not great condition at all, is, has missed a lot of the rains and is, is uh, not getting that, that good a start. So uh, that's the other factor that's going on there besides this Russia-Ukraine thing. But the recent sharp run-up is mainly due to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the prospects for reduced wheat exports into the world market. This is just that uh, Minneapolis spring wheat futures again, but shown from a long-term basis back to 2008 when the record prices were hit back in January of that year. Some of you might remember that 17 to $20 a bushel short-term time frame. But anyway, I wanted to just show that for a perspective of the, of the longer term. And here we are lately now, uh, we're running up to those 2012, uh, 2011, 2012 highs, and uh, we're still a long ways from the all-time highs, but nonetheless, it's getting, it's getting right up there. And uh, it's been uh, effective in raising the price of wheat at the, uh, the bids for the uh, buyers that we're dealing with as well. In terms of Canadian wheat acreage, excluding Durham, uh, our wheat acreage, and this is somewhat skewed because of my uh, uh, my work with the y-axis here. So I, I haven't got this starting at zero is what I should say. So we had about 18 million acres of wheat seeded in Canada last year. And it was lower though, uh, not so much because of uh, any other reason than relatively poor economics uh, in comparison to other crops. So production though was quite low. Uh, about 19 million tons is the StatsCan estimate compared to 28 million tons the year before. And uh, you know why that was the dryness. In terms of wheat movement so far this year, uh, kind of in the middle here, I've got 2021 or last year's crop year to date deliveries, exports and domestic use on wheat. And this is from the Canada Grain Commission. Uh, and then I've got an update there for uh, this current crop year. So we've uh, had farmer deliveries of about 3 million tons less than a year ago and exports of about 5 million tons less. Domestic use, uh, very similar. So there isn't much change really in the uh, wheat that's needed in Canada for milling and those operations. But the exports is a side that tends to be suffering. In terms of exports, I'm projecting about 13 million tons and uh, we're still on track to hit that. But We'll see what happens as a result of these higher prices. Uh, the flip side is that if we end up getting more wheat export business out of this situation in Ukraine, then uh, it'll be easier to hit this target. So the uncertainty has ramped up. In terms of expected wheat area uh, or wheat carryover, I'm projecting about 2.8 million tons compared with 4.9 year ago. So quite uh, tight carryover of wheat in the system and in farmers bins is expected. In terms of milling wheat price uh, had fallen off as shown in that futures graph earlier on here, but uh, rebounded lately somewhat at least. Uh, and this is just for three or four elevators surveyed in the Edmonton area. 
In terms of uh, Canadian Durham markets, uh, carryover has been fairly tight for the last two years and is expected to be tight again this current crop year. Um, Durham prices had been as high as 20 or $21 a bushel earlier on uh, in uh, before Christmas time and uh, has fallen off or had fallen off to 16 or $15 a bushel lately. Uh, maybe just with a bit of a temporary, possibly temporary oversupply in the market and then no buyers in the meantime. But just lately, um, because of dryness in Morocco, Algeria and, and the North African countries and, and also uh, uh, northern Mediterranean, the southern part of the northern Mediterranean countries are also dry. And so there's been some export business uh, bid for and, and just underway right now. And we'll just see if Canada gets any of that business. Canada is a major exporter of Durham in the world market. So just to summarize on the wheat market, uh, world wheat supplies are lower, but not particularly tight yet. Uh, Russia had been increasing their export restrictions to try to control inflation over there. And uh, that's... <laughs> kind of all in, up on hold right now because they're really not exporting much of anything, although they likely will be able to export to at least China and some other limited countries uh, after all these uh, sanctions are enacted. Uh, the Russian winter wheat acreage had been somewhat lower because of dryness over there, but I'm not sure how much of an impact that will have. Uh, just as an aside, where Russia produces about 80 million tons of wheat, Ukraine has been producing about 33 million tons this last year. So major producer there as well. And uh, there is some excellent land, of course, in Ukraine. And that could be part of the, the plan here by Russia, too. I, it's hard to know what exactly the thinking is yet, but uh, that could be part of it. It's just the agricultural capacity that Ukraine has. Record Australian crop, but some quality issues developed uh, during harvest there. Uh, from rains in their eastern part of the country. U.S. Uh, winter wheat area continues dry, as I mentioned. And then uh, we've got this situation in Ukraine, which is rallying the U.S. and Canadian prices. I mentioned the Canadian export pace is on target for projected exports. Feed wheat demand remains strong and keeps that, that up, upper quality wheat uh, well supported because of the demand for feed wheat, despite the uh, influx of U.S. corn coming into Alberta and the, uh, the feedlots in Saskatchewan as well. So strong prices continue and then we've got the inflation factor going on plus this uh, hopefully temporary situation over in Ukraine. Protein spreads remain uh, disappointingly weak, in some cases non-existent. And from what I gather, that is just due to a large amount of protein produced in the world in the wheat crops this last year. Uh, surprising, I guess, in, in uh, considering that Australia had some uh, rain damaged crops and so on, but uh, that's the understanding I have. Uh, last year, the U.S. had a pretty good protein crop with their winter wheat crop too as well, so that could indeed be part of it also. But anyway, okay, on the feed grains, uh, just a few comments on corn, first of all, because it so much relates to our feed grain situation. U.S. corn ending stocks had been drawn down sharply the previous year and uh, currently forecast by USDA at about uh, 1.5 billion bushels and uh, potentially drawn down further if the ethanol use keeps rising and if uh, the situation with Ukraine continues. Uh, that Black Sea area, that is Russia and Ukraine combined, they export about 20% of the world corn exports in total. So with that source being shut off again, it's uh, resulting in a push higher in corn prices on the idea that there could be exports, uh, increasing exports coming from the US. In terms of US corn price, it's uh, run up sharply in the last few days uh, on the situation with the invasion of Ukraine. And uh, just going back to 2008, you can see uh, the previous highs and so on, but uh, it's getting up there. And that's uh, making corn imports more expensive for us, but uh, depends how far some feedlots have 
apparently booked ahead all the way into new crops. So some are covered fairly well and some are not. Canadian barley seeded and harvested acreage graph. Uh, typically there's a fair amount of distance in there to account for barley that's silaged or put up as green feed or maybe even grazed in some cases. But um, anyway, last year you can see the, the wider range there because of the dryness and the effect on uh, barley crops uh, with the amount that was put up for salvage. In terms of production, uh, way down to about 7 million tons this last year, uh, particularly due to dryness. In terms of exports so far this year, uh, started off uh, with exports really strong for barley. Uh, probably a lot of it was contracted prior to harvest and the knowledge that we would have a low production crop. And so exports were very strong to start out and they've uh, waned since then. But nonetheless, we're sitting there with exports of about 1.6 million tons. And that compares to my estimate of total exports for the crop year of about 2.6. So uh, we're, we're chugging right along yet on barley exports. So we've got uh, feed usage has had been strong too until U.S. corn arrived and there's still some barley being used all right, but uh, a lot less now with the amount of corn that's coming in. And I'm just estimating so far based on previous years that the U.S. corn imports will be somewhere in that two to two and a half million ton range in total for this current crop year and perhaps even some into August for that matter. In terms of exports, I'm just showing that uh, the history of barley exports. Uh, there's been some years that we didn't have much to export. Uh, last year was a really strong export year, uh, particularly demand again to China, but also regularly we have strong demand or continuing demand to Japan, particularly for malt barley. In terms of carryover, extremely tight. I'm not sure if we can even get this tight, but uh, that's the forecast at this time pending a revision to uh, crop yields for last year, possibly. In terms of feed barley, it's hanging right in there at, at historically high levels. Uh, this is just the Lethbridge price, and you're probably uh, already aware of the weekly that we put out, and it's available on, either on our website or by email subscription at no cost, but it uh, provides a bit of a, a guideline as to what's happening with many crop and livestock prices, but also bar barley is on there and the Lethbridge range each week. Uh, so just to summarize on barley then, uh, they've, prices have remained high, livestock feed demand and exports had been strong year to date. U.S. corn imports are large and capping the feed barley prices, although I understand that barley prices have moved up a bit this week because of the increase of corn prices and the idea that barley prices have to move higher to keep uh, our stocks on hand our, our we'll have nothing left virtually. So the bottom line to that, either because of the corn price influence or the factor that if barley prices did fall, it would stimulate exports. The barley prices are expected to remain high for at least the balance of this crop year. Just a comment on oats, a uh, similar situation there on production as in lower, uh, low 70s bushels an acre average and uh, ending stocks uh, draw down to very tight levels. There is uh, a tight supply of good quality oats. Some of the oats, of course, was uh, low bushel weight because of the dryness. We've got strong demand on both the feed and milling side, and that milling side is continuing to ramp up. Um, we've got strong demand from the U.S. for quality oats, uh, also strong demand from Mexico. Uh, you may be familiar with that oat milk product. Uh, many of you have tried it likely and and uh, it's catching on. You see a lot of it on TV, they're on sitcoms, they're pouring oat milk and and they're now adding it in, in coffees. I notice at some of the coffee shops and this kind of thing. So it's a bit of fad, but uh, no doubt healthy and is an alternative, of course, to dairy milk. But also then there's the ongoing popularity of oat cereal and fractionation that is growing the demand for oats as we move forward here. So nothing but upside for the future of oats, it seems. And prices are, have been record high, in some cases over $9 a bushel, and even feed prices are in that $7 range. So very strong prices for oats. Uh, just a note on that and the contracting side, some of the uh, 
buyers have been offering an act of God clauses for some of these and oats has been one of those. So that's something to watch for, particularly in light of uh, all the contract buyouts that had to happen this last year is the value of those act of God clauses, even if it's at a lower price. Comments on peas then, acreage dropped this last year, but again, this is skewed because of adjustment to my Y axis, but about 3.8 million acres of peas were seeded and peas go up and down a bit. Some of it is influenced by the previous fall and some farmers saying, I'm not gonna grow those again, but <laughs> then a year or two, they turn around because the prices are so good and the agronomics are so positive that they grow them again and, and so on. So anyway, pea production was down sharply, about 2.2 million tons is the forecast or estimate. In terms of ending stocks, extremely tight like many of the other crops. In September, we had uh, Canadian pea exports a record high. And so again, that was likely contracted pea deliveries uh, that, were, that were contracted well before it was known that the crop was short. But the export pace is running about half of a year ago. We just don't have the peas to export. Uh, China, again, is the major buyer of our peas. And I, again, as I said, there'll be tight carryover. Prices have come off a bit, although they're wide ranging depending on who's providing the bid. Yellow is currently in the 14 to 1750 a bushel range. A new crop yellow is 1150 to about 12. And with shopping around, you might be able to find something higher than that. On the greens, uh, a little bit discounted to the yellows, 13 and a quarter to about 14 a bushel right now. And feed peas uh, still strong, uh, 12 to 14. And, and if they got any lower, I'm sure even cattle people be, would be wanting them for protein to mix off with straw for rations because of course, forage supplies are still tight and, uh, and some people with livestock are still scrambling to find enough forage. Just a comment on faba beans, uh, Canadian 2021 acreage was about 133,000 acres. Production was about 73,000 tons, which is not a great yield. Again, uh, faba beans suffered from the dryness and faba beans do not like to be dry. And so prices right now about that $13 a bushel level, they are a substitute for peas in rations. And so they kind of form a bottom at least for uh, feed pea prices, but are also used for human consumption, of course. And they're also an alternative for feed peas from an agronomic point of view for those that have uh, uh, grown peas quite a bit maybe and, and uh, have pea diseases in their fields. Just a comment on lentils. Um, acreage has been more or less steady for the num last number of years. Uh, production was sharply lower because lentils tends to be grown in the drier areas and they were the driest areas generally in the province and the prairies. So lentil production was way down. In terms of exports, it'll be curtailed because of the short supplies and carryover will be extremely tight on lentils as well. In terms of prices, Laird's currently in the 50 to 52 cent a pound range, Eston's 44 to 49 and Red's in the 35 to 39 range. Again, shopping around is the key there. On that note, I have, um, although it needs a bit of updating, a directory of crop buyers that some of you may have obtained from me over the years and you're welcome to request that by email if you wish. It's just an Excel spreadsheet of a lot of different crop buyers in Alberta particularly. Comments on soybeans because of its relationship mainly to canola markets. The world ending stocks have been coming off a bit lately and potentially would be drawn down more because of the uh, lower production now expected out of South America due to dryness, uh, particularly in Southern Brazil and Argentina. And they're blaming that, not that on uh, La Nina and the weather uh, that's impacted because of that uh, uneven sea temperature. So soybean production in the US, uh, very strong production year last year, near record or at record. And that followed a record South American harvest a year ago that finished off in May or so last year. But um, the situation now is that South America was expected to produce a record crop as of two months ago. And now that's come off by, instead of 145 million tons, uh, it's come off to maybe 120 to 130 million tons. So a big drop there. 
In terms of U.S. ending stocks of soybeans, uh, it's being ratcheted down a little bit, particularly late because uh, China, which had not been buying many soybeans until South America ran out of beans pretty much until their new harvest began, began uh, in the last few weeks here. But uh, the U.S. has been selling more soybeans to China, particularly lately, and other countries as well. But uh, in subsequent uh, monthly USDA reports, that right-hand figure of 325 has been coming down a little bit each month and may come down further yet. So that's another factor that's been supporting soybean prices. There is one forecast I've seen that because of the interruptions uh, with exports out of Ukraine, particularly of uh, sunflower seed oil, uh, in that they export about 80% of the world exports out of there, and also the lower crop expected out of South America, and the need to particularly have China, China to have need to uh, import more U.S. soybeans, that that soybean carryover for the next year in the U.S. could be drawn down further yet. So we'll see what happens there. And of course, we're a long ways from that, that U.S. crop being seeded and produced yet, but it won't be, uh, it, it'll be a, a volatile price summer is what we have ahead of us. Okay, so just a quick look at the uh, U.S. soybean price going back to 2008, and it's a continuous graph for the May futures. So we're in that uh, $16.50 to $17 a bushel area right now, and you can see the run up last week from the, uh, the result of the invasion, but uh, we're not quite to record highs, but it's close. <laughs> in terms of uh, soy meal futures, and this is a more current graph, so it does show that run up last Thursday when the invasion occurred. And uh, that is right up at record prices for soy meal. Same thing on soy oil, this is May soy oil, soy oil futures. Uh, up to record highs now, all-time highs. The same thing, this is hard to see because trading is so thin, but this is a graph of Malaysian palm oil futures. It's also up at record highs now. And it had been uh, working higher from that $1,000 a ton US level for a few reasons. There was uh, interrupted harvest because of COVID uh, illnesses among workers in the producing countries of Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, they weren't able to get harvests done as quickly as they could. And so there's been interruptions from that, not just the, the harvest workers, but also port workers and, and the, the COVID disruptions were a major factor there in, uh, in that market. Turning to canola then, seeded acreage was quite strong last year at about 22 and a half million acres but production was uh, sharply curtailed down to about 12.6 million tons, according to StatsCan. And uh, I'm wondering if that might be coming up a little bit with future estimates, just based on the fact that, that uh, canola can sometimes outproduce expectations, but it may not be much of adjustment. That's just an aside so far, but it's happened that the StatsCan numbers have been increased for canola on production each of the last three or four years. But uh, I'm just wondering about that. I don't think that we've got an abundance of canola out there, so I don't wanna make that uh, a news item. <laughs> anyway, canola exports, I'm forecasting at about 5.4 million tons, down sharply from last year's strong level of 10.5. And so far, uh, we're on track to meet or exceed that level based on the export uh, level that we've made so far to about halfway through the crop year. On the crushing side, I'm forecasting about 8 million tons to be crushed. And we're on track to exceed that right now too. So that is a reason that canola prices need to stay high for this old crop at least in order to protect those remaining supplies. And what's been happening of course is that uh, the Crushers have been generally outbidding the elevators, which the elevators is not entirely, but mainly for export destinations. So canola stocks will be extremely tight based on my forecast. I don't know again, if we can get this low in actual fact, but it'll be right down there to, to nearly nothing. That's what it looks like. 
This is a graph of the canola futures. And uh, I'm showing here the May on top in black, the July in blue, and the November in magenta. And you can see then that the May is higher than the July and before it expires, the March has been higher than the May and previous to that, the January was higher than the March. We call that an inverted market. It's a market that's a signal of strong near-term demand. In other words, the market saying through the futures at least, we want that product now rather than later. And that's really what it's saying. And then for November, that's just having built in the expectation of a renewed supply and hopefully better supply uh, for a new crop availability uh, come uh, September, October, this next fall. So that's what's happening there. But even in November, it's been ratcheting up uh, quite a bit. And so uh, new crop prices are very strong as well. This is a graph of just going back to mid-December of uh, the May contract elevator crusher uh, prices by comparison. So the upper level uh, line represents the crusher prices and the elevator price is shown below. So generally, with the exception of some occasional specials that may have been offered by elevator companies, the crushers have been outbidding the elevators for your canola. And that's to keep their crushing operations running. Uh, crushing has been profitable until maybe six weeks or two months ago. Uh, the thing is, you, you can't really tell unless you're a crusher exactly what's going on, on inside, of course. We can calculate uh, crush margins based off soy meal and soybean oil, but then canola oil has a large premium to soy oil. So we can't really tell what the bottom line economics are, but obviously the crushers still want your product. So that's why they're still bidding as aggressively as they are. Although the basis levels for some of the months out to near the end now of old crop have peeled off here lately, implying that, uh, peeled off, I mean weakened, implying that the crushers are more, um, I guess, comfortable with their uh, contracts that they have in place for their needs. So what I'm referring to by basis is just that difference between the futures and cash price. So again, as a reminder, basis equals cash minus futures price. And so here again, the elevator basis is generally weaker than the crusher basis. And that results in that higher price for each representative futures month or delivery month that you're looking at. And here I'm just tracking May delivery as an example. So to summarize on canola, strong vegetable oil demand with lower supplies across the world. Palm oil prices have been supported by strong demand and also the labor problems that I referred to, uh, mainly because of COVID. Global move towards biodiesel production, and that's, that's become more evident here lately again, too. And uh, there's a few factors going on there. There's another um, formulation that's been developed for biodiesel that's, uh, that has even a lower carbon content, so it may have um, more um, application to markets like California where environmental concerns are higher and the, the laws are more stringent. Indonesia currently has a 30% biodiesel inclusion rate over there and they're testing a 40% biodiesel blend right now. So there, there you have an example of the kind of movement that's underway. The EU is backing away from using palm oil to make biodiesel on their environmental concerns about deforestation in the palm oil producing countries. Uh, so that implies that EU may need to use more rapeseed oil and soy oil and then canola oil as well, which is uh, hard to believe at these current high prices for, for the vegetable oils, but nonetheless uh, could become a reality over time. In the Canadian situation, we've got that rising Canadian canola crushing capacity with the three new plants announced for Regina and expansion at Yorkton and maybe otherwise, that's about 5 million tons of extra demand domestically that we potentially will be having in the next two or three years if all these plants get built. And that will translate into the uh, restriction on being able to export that same 5 million tons. So that tends to be price supportive uh, we don't need more acres, particularly of canola. We need more production per acre. So we'll see how this all shakes out. Canola oil, as I mentioned, has a premium price to most other vegetable oils. And at one point, 
I'd read that uh, canola oil had a 15 cent a pound premium to soybean oil, so it's quite expensive. Uh, on the other hand though, canola oil and meal both have uh, very well developed markets. And so a lot of those markets are more or less uh, not affected by price and they'll buy, they'll buy that product regardless almost of what the price is with a uh, little substitution, but certainly the higher prices get, the more chance for substitution with other products that there may be. And I've, I've already talked a lot about the biodiesel men and those extra crushing plants that are, plants that are being built. Uh, I've talked a bit about basis. Uh, that basis uh, level can be watched for change in commercial demand. Uh, one of the articles I wrote and made it to some of the papers back in early January was about the idea of locking in deferred old crop basis for those wanting to wait for canola sales and a higher price yet. Uh, back then, you could lock in basis levels for June, July at crushers at least of anywhere of 40 to $80 over the July futures. And my strategy suggestion there was to lock in those strong basis levels at 40 to 80 over the futures and then leave the futures outstanding while uh, you gave that futures a chance to rally, which for uh, the reasons that I've talked about it has, but uh, I think it would have rallied anyway to probably a thousand dollars a ton. So anyway, that would have been a strategy and may still be a strategy to consider for that matter, but uh, you can watch basis levels or that difference between cash and futures as a signal of a change in commercial demand, or in this case, a signal that they are, uh, they, they, the crushers particularly, are getting their needs fulfilled somewhat in the form of contracts with farmers. Comments on flax, uh, again, like the other crops, very tight carryover and fairly high prices. If flax has been historically record high up to $35 a bushel or higher and higher. Okay, with that, uh, you might ask me, what am I gonna grow? Well, any, everything looks pretty good. So I think the factors to consider are rotation. Um, of course, economics, and that includes the cost of inputs. So things like not only fuel, which has also been rising a lot, lot as you know, don't know, but also the fertilizer. It looks to me like we'll have available fertilizer here in Alberta. We're such a big producer of most of it, but uh, prices doesn't don't look like they're gonna drop. Um, they actually had dropped at the U.S. ports until this last week when they've shot back up again on the concern about uh, the impact of what's going on in Ukraine. I wanted to draw your attention then to uh, some of the products that Alberta Agriculture has available yet on the Government of Alberta website. It used to be Alberta Agriculture website and now it's uh, in a larger website. So things are a little more difficult to find, but generally can find it on a search. There's that weekly crop market review that I referred to earlier as being available either on the website or by subscription by email. And uh, the farm manager is with that website too. And within that farm manager section, there's uh, information on marketing, financial management and production economics, including a, a standalone uh, program that's free called AgriProfits. Uh, there's also one called Crop Choices, and then just coming out now will be Cropping Alternatives. And that's just a bit of a snapshot uh, of the relative economics of crops across Alberta in different soil zones. It's not um, hard and fast government estimates. It's just an estimate for you to use as a guideline to uh, insert your own numbers over top of and to perhaps make... Uh, some cropping decisions if you haven't already made them. 